Thanks for inviting me to be here. This is a really kind of fun topic to talk about. I really enjoyed um, working with Allison and others in our in our kind of Great Lakes area over the past couple of years talking about chloride. And so today I want to touch on a kind of a Michigan specific um, perspective on it, uh, how we've developed chloride uh, aquatic life values. Those are the values that are protective of aquatic life in Michigan. A little bit about that process, how we came about those numbers and sort of then what that means for our program in Michigan. And then I think Bob's going to give a, a good perspective on it from an Ohio standpoint as well. Um, so first, I want to touch really quick, broadly on why we even do this kind of thing. So whether it's chloride or whether it's um, any other toxic chemical or metal that might impact uh, the environment, um, we'll go over a little bit what it is, why the, what the reason is that, that our departments um, develop these numbers. Uh, I'll talk about some of the details on chloride specifically, and then what, it, again, what it means for our program and how we move forward in terms of protecting water quality in Michigan. So the Clean Water Act is the, the primary document that um, gives the structure for regulating water quality uh, in every state and uh, the tribes with authority in the nation. And one of the requirements under the Clean Water Act is that we all develop water quality standards. And so this is these are kind of constants between um, any state or tribe that has water quality um, authority. And so the the, the musts are similar between everybody. How we do it can be a little different. And that's what we'll talk about, some of these differences between the states and between tribes and things and why you might see different, slightly different numbers and things like that or different processes that are used to develop those. Um, but we're required to develop water quality standards. Um, and really the, the objective of the Clean Water Act is to restore the um, quality of our nation's water, the chemical, physical, biological integrity of the waters. Um, and ultimately return them back to sort of unimpacted condition, which is a very lofty goal, a great goal, but a tough one when you put this many people on the landscape and affect the kind of changes that we have. In the interim, we wanna make sure that we at least are protecting for things like uh, propagation, the ability for things like fish and shellfish, wildlife, things that live in and on and around the water to thrive and survive. And that's often why we develop things like aquatic life criteria and values to protect for these sorts of um, components of our water quality. So water quality standards, again, everybody's got to make these, um, develop these, and they come in three parts. Uh, they include things like criteria, which are what most people think of when they think of standards. They're the numbers, um, sometimes the condition, the narrative that you can't go above, that you want to try to maintain those conditions so that you're protecting the different uses uh, of your waters. So that gets us to the second one, designated uses. These are the, the sort of values and function of our waters, um, and standards have to include those as well. And then there always has to be an anti-degradation component too, which basically means we don't want to take steps backward in water quality. We're always trying to move forward, we're always trying to maintain or increase our water quality uh, to protect for, for different things. So that's sort of the component of, of water quality standards. Uh, again, for anybody that's got the delegated authority, that's every state and tribe that has that for the Clean Water Act, has to develop water quality standards that have these three components to them. Um, so in Michigan, uh, up top here in this diagram, we've got the criteria, the uses, and that anti-degradation component, and they all feed into the protection of um, the great aquatic resources that Michigan's got, as well as the other Great Lakes states. Um, and then we within um, EGLE, and I should spell that out, so it's Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy is what we're called in Michigan now. We used to be called Department of Environmental Quality, um, and that EGLE changed a couple of years ago. So same organization, as Allison said, to <coughs> like Ohio EPA, we're protecting things like air, water quality, things like that. Um, and in order to support um, these water quality standards, these uses and these criteria development, make sure that we're protecting water quality, we develop monitoring and permitting programs that um, help make sure that we're kind of continuing to move forward and have gains in water quality um, versus going backwards. Uh, so... When we're talking about designated uses, this is an important part that I like to discuss because this is one of those places that um, the Clean Water Act says that each state needs to or, or tribe needs to have certain uses, protect for certain parts um, of, of the function of, of our aquatic ecosystems. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing you can protect for. So this is one of those places where you'll see kind of divergence a little bit within states and tribes because while we all have these core uses that we need to protect for, things like human health um, and aquatic life, um, we will also, as states have different priorities and different needs and tribes have different priorities, develop their, our own uses that are important to our certain areas or our, our, our um, citizenry. 
Um, so in Michigan, it's things like agriculture use for irrigation, uh, industrial water supply use for intakes um, and use of water for things like um, industrial processes. Um, as well as the kind of typical things we think of abuses, which is fish consumption, aquatic life, the ability for the ecosystem to function as it is, um, recreation, the ability to swim and wade safely in our waters. And so all of these designated uses kind of encompass those, um, th those values um, and function that we want to see in our water resources. So let's talk a little bit about criteria. Um, specifically, since we're talking about chloride as a toxicant, um, as something that can you know, harm aquatic life. Uh, for Michigan, this falls under what's called our Rule 57. I will try not to get super jargony, but it's tough given the careers that Bob and I are both in um, to not have a little bit of it. So I'll certainly if there's any questions or something that's confusing, let's talk at the end. But um, um, our Rule 57, which is part of our water quality standards, tells us the process by which we develop um, toxicological values, things that are protective of aquatic life. Um, and that process basically uses um, a host of toxicological data. These are data that are developed within labs on a certain chemical, chloride in this case, um, against a whole bunch of different aquatic uh, organisms. And that allows us then to um, go through essentially a series of math equations to come up with these values that are then protective of those same organisms and others like them in our streams and lakes and the Great Lakes and wetlands. And so we use this host of toxicological data that come out of different labs um, all around the, the world, really, and, and develop both protective values for acute, which is a short-term impact, um, you know, particularly harmful. Often it's um, things like uh, direct uh, impacts like death of organisms. Um, but we also want to protect for chronic, longer-term impacts. So um, we develop numbers, values that are protective of both. Um, both short-term impacts, or usually those are pretty high, think of things like spills and things that might happen, uh, as well as chronic impacts. We want to protect for that long-term existence of these species, this range of species. So that's growth and reproduction and all those things are encompassed. Um, the bottom line with all this is the more toxicological data that we have on the more diverse group of organisms, the better the number is that we can come up with. The more confident we are, that the number that we develop is protective of, of a wider range of aquatic life. In Michigan, this process is spelled out in our rules. Um, and with all our Great Lakes states, um, it, it should follow people. We all should have the similar process. Um, and that should be following a, a Great Lakes guidance that came out by the US EPA um, that really tried to kind of coalesce the processes by which Great Lakes states and tribes protect their water resources and, and, and create a fairly level playing field, at least in how, how it all works. Um, and then this whole process then within Michigan, again, is in our rule, it's in our water quality standards, and this was approved uh, by the US EPA as the kind of methods that we can use to go forward to protect water quality here in our state. All right, so let's shift to chloride then. So why chloride? Uh, um, we're kind of, Michigan's kind of latecomers to the game, as I'll talk about in a minute, within our Great Lakes region in developing our values. Um, and it's, again, this gets just really generally back to state priorities and where we see problems and what kinds of things we're, we have the capacity to tackle. Um, but we certainly have seen higher chloride numbers. So this is just a kind of a heat map. Um, essentially, it's a summary of water quality data around the state from our water chemistry monitoring program. Um, this one is a 2005 to 14 data set, but essentially where you see red, higher chloride numbers. Um, and we've been seeing this for some time and are seeing it kind of more and more that we're seeing more red showing up, not surprisingly, um, higher urbanized areas, places like uh, Detroit metro area, uh, Grand Rapids and, and things like that. So, but without a value, without an understanding of what these numbers we're seeing in lakes and streams compared to where, when they could be harmful, all this is, is, a, is a heat map. All it tells us is it's, it's hotter there. It's, it's, um, the numbers are higher there for chloride, but we don't know if that means that they're a problem. Um, and so we needed to develop water quality values for aquatic life to let us understand where there are problems versus just where it's, where it's uh, higher concentrations or not. Uh, as I said, this, this is something that's kind of long overdue in Michigan. And, and we're getting more and more questions about what do these numbers mean when we're in the field? What do these numbers mean um, in lakes and streams? And so it's going to help us interpret that. The other thing it helps us do is within Michigan, uh, chloride has always been kind of captured within our permitting system as part of our total dissolved solids rule, which is sort of a narrative rule um, to, 
that our permittees think uh, industrial wastewater treatment plants, things like that, um, were trying to make sure that they were uh, meeting this narrative rule that said total dissolved solids can't be above a certain level that's going to impact, um, you know, aquatic life and other uses. But without any real numbers, it's a tough thing to implement. So often um, th that's a tougher rule uh, to implement without just sort of technological um, endpoints. So this gives us an actual number to start kind of chipping away at understanding what those discharge numbers might look like and where we can protect that. Um, one of the other things that's sort of serendipitous really is that recently in the last, I don't know, when I said recently, probably five or more years, there's been a, an interesting um, kind of uptick in additional chloride toxicological data. Remember I said, the more data we've got, the more diverse species, the better number we can develop, and the more confident we can be that we're protecting that wide range. And recently, um, it, there's been a push to develop some additional toxicological information for chloride on, a, on some new species, which really just helps us better, better um, develop the numbers. So we'll talk about that next. I keep talking about our region, Great Lakes region. This is really our, our US EPA region, region five, um, that encompasses um, kind of these states, many of which have waters that flow to the Great Lakes. Uh, Michigan got all of them. Um, we, we've, we only flow to the Great Lakes. Um, but, but again, within these Great Lakes drainage ways, these Great Lakes watershed, we all should be approaching things, again, following that US EPA Great Lakes guidance in a similar fashion, but that doesn't necessarily always mean that we have the same numbers that come out of it because we still have different processes um, and different um, data sets that'll feed into that. So for example, this is an overview of um, our chloride. Uh, I should have corrected this. This is just the chloride numbers. We have a sulfate as well, but our chloride criteria um, in this region, in this Great Lakes region. And you'll see quick looking at this, the, the takeaway is um, Michigan, are the, we're the latest, most recent ones to develop values. Our numbers are also the most restrictive, they're the lowest. Um, and, and I think a lot of that probably is due to the fact that um, we were able to use some of that more recent toxicological data that was linked to some, um, some studies uh, specifically with things like mayflies and freshwater mussels that showed some um, pretty, pretty uh, significant toxic impacts at low values. And so if you're a state um, that has developed your numbers, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, when those data weren't available, perhaps that's one of the reasons why we're seeing differences here. But again, everybody's got a similar process, but it doesn't always come out in the same um, values as you're seeing here. So we've got a, a range of conditions, um, a range of values around uh, the Great Lakes region. Uh, and Michigan at this point, again, is the most, uh, most restrictive, but also uh, the most recently developed. So our numbers were developed, these values were developed in 2019. Uh, so it's, it's, they're still fairly new. So we'll talk about, remember, we develop both acute and chronic. So acute's to develop to protect short-term impacts and chronic's to develop, protect longer-term impacts. Um, one of the, this was an impressive data set that went into the acute um, value derivation. So we had 57 species that we had toxicological data for. So that's, that's studies that have been done on 57 different species using a range of chloride values that can show some sort of a dose response um, to that. And within our rules, we've got, uh, again, it's, it's a process that steps through and says you should try to um, get this range of species, these types of species and things like that to develop that kind of math equation that goes through the process. And so 57 species is a pretty extensive um, uh, data set. And so we, we met all of our minimum requirements to develop numbers. You'll see here, I call this a tier one value. So tier one is, the, is sort of the most confident we can be in, in, a, in a value development. Um, that means we've got the most diverse um, grouping of, of toxicological data. So these are tier one values, which is, which is a good thing. And importantly, uh, invertebrates make up um, a lot of the most sensitive species. So these are uh, you know, aquatic insects, um, things like freshwater mussels, uh, that are in many of our lakes and streams and form the basis of food chains and things like that. So, and are used widely as indicators of water quality. Um, so they all get ranked um, and I'll show this in a minute. And then we use kind of the most sensitive um, species to come up with a number that, that is overall um, generally protective of most things out there in a nutshell. Um, so these are our values that we developed for acute, um, and this is in parts per billion. Um, so if you want to do parts per million, which is micrograms, you just take off those trailing three zeros. So our acute value, which is used in our things like our NPDES, um, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permits, um, is 640, um, 640,000 micrograms per liter. 
Um, our target for in-stream, our surface water target is half that. And so that's 320,000 um, micrograms per liter as our aquatic maximum value, we call it. Uh, and so, so those are our acute numbers. We should try to always stay below those if we wanna protect against acute sort of short-term impact. You'll see chronic numbers are often um, understandably much lower because then we're looking at longer term impact um, over things like growth and life, life cycles. Um, but to look at this acute data set, it's, it's, it's uh, a little mind numbing with seeing 57 um, genus species names in it. But, but just to show you, essentially, it's a range of sensitivity. So the bottom left uh, are the most sensitive. Um, they are impacted the earliest by the lowest concentrations of chloride up to the top right. Um, which are kind of more robust, more resilient. And what we've developed again are these numbers. So the dotted vertical line is the number that we developed for our uh, aquatic maximum value. That's our in-stream number, the 320,000 um, micrograms per liter. And the solid vertical is our acute value that we use in things like permits. So that's the 640. And so you'll see now just by the process that we've developed with this much data and sort of the math that's involved, um, those lines don't capture every single species. Um, there, are, there are some kind of margins of error that get put in, things like that. And so um, these do protect essentially like 96 to 98% of the, the species that we have toxicological data should be protected by this, um, the values that are developed. And that's a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty conservative number. Um, now you'll see for the same process, and the, oh, I want to talk, these are, just to put like real things in, in these aren't like weird creatures that you've never heard of. Um, the stuff that, that we're getting toxicological data on are things like fish and insects, uh, mussels, snails, uh, you know, real things that exist really in our streams in the upper Midwest. And so um, this is what we're trying to protect and that these are what the toxicological data um, were based on and, and were used. So. Same process for a chronic uh, development. This is again, longer term. So you can see a, a smaller number um, at the bottom there, our chronic number is it's 150,000 micrograms per liter. So remember the acute was 640 and 320 and now it's 150. So if we're shooting for kind of looking in our streams and lakes, what's a stay below, this is the number. Cause this not only protects from that acute short-term impact but it protects for our longer term life cycle growth that sort of stuff, reproduction impacts. Um, this also had a pretty good data set. Um, it's still a tier one value. This is still um, about as good as it gets in terms of the ability to, to look, at, uh, look at data sets and develop numbers from it. And similarly, again, this is chronic. So this is a more expensive test to run, a diff more difficult test to run. So we don't see as many of these um, when you're going through the toxicological research, um, typically the shorter tests. So you don't get the same kind of numbers, but we still have a pretty solid um, data set and it's, and it's arranged similarly. So bottom left are the ones that are most susceptible um, to, the, to, the, to chloride and top right are more robust, but each one of them has an endpoint above which we would assume that there'd be impacts. Um, our value um, and kind of the math involved with it um, gives us this number of 150, which you see is protective of the entire range of, uh, of the aquatic life for which we have toxicological data. And so, and, and again, similar to the last one, these aren't just things that, you know, you've never heard of or never seen, things like rainbow trout, mayflies, um, zooplankton, mussels. So they're protective of real things in our real streams. Um, so what's this mean for Michigan? So it's quite a process and there's a lot of math involved and we've got toxicologists on our staff who do all of the data vetting and making sure that what we're using is the soundest science we can. Um, this gives us then as a state thresholds that we can do a number of things. One, um, we can use them to help uh, with our permittees understand what kinds of water quality concerns we have maybe going out of their pipes. Uh, are there things that they need to kind of watch for, control for uh, from a chloride standpoint? Um, and, and having these actual values now gives us that threshold versus just some sort of a narrative process that we hope that they kind of continue to address them. But without knowing a hard number, this, this gives us um, something that that is clear for both the agency and also for the permittees to understand um, above what point they might be having an impact on the river stream, uh, lake wetland that they, they might be discharging to. 
It also, for those of us who do water quality monitoring around the state, and that's part of where I sit in the organization, um, it gives us thresholds to understand what our samples mean. So when we go out and take water samples from lakes and streams and have a number, um, this now gives us a threshold that we can compare that to and say, this either isn't an issue or we think there might be something going on here that we need to pay more attention to. And so all of this helps really guide better decisions, um, both from a permitting standpoint, from a monitoring standpoint. Uh, it simplifies and kind of makes our rule interpretation a little more consistent um, and really ultimately gets back to those Clean Water Act goals, which is moving that water quality ball forward, not backward, and trying to identify where there are problems and ways that we can um, address them. So um, that in a nutshell, and I think we'll take questions later, it sounds like. Um, I can't help but throw this picture in. This is uh, American Lotus. If you've never seen it, um, we have it, uh, Southeast Michigan in particular. I know a couple of big colonies. And when I'm up close to these, these aquatic plants, uh, they're amazing. And uh, I said, this is one of those things I see where I think it was Ann Geddes that took the pictures of a little babies always on like huge plants and stuff. And I always feel like that's what uh, these look like. They're, they're amazing uh, freshwater kind of lilies that uh, little pads that grow. So all right, and with that, I am out, and I will kick this, I think, over to Bob. So uh, thank you, Kevin. You did a marvelous job of kind of uh, of teeing up um, what I'm going to say, and, and it's good that, you know, people have sort of that administrative framework ringing in their ear as I, as I go through through my um, slides. So I'm, I'm Bob Meltner. I work with the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. I'm a, a field biologist uh, in in large part for, for most of my career, and and, and recently um, if if uh, retired into an office setting, um, so uh, but don't hold that against me. Um, any anyway, I'm going to go through some of our data and, and talk a little bit. It, it's I'm going to be recasting some of what Kevin Kevin said in a, in a slightly different way. I think to, to help give you an additional perspective and framework on what it is we're trying to do and, and how it is that we're, we're going about it. Um, so one, one way to think, think about things is what, and what we like to really do in Ohio is think about things in terms of the biocondition gradient. We do a lot of biological monitoring and we try to let the bugs and fish that, that we assess in the streams tell us about what's going on in the environment. So they're, they're uh, essentially, you can think about it. Um, you can go to a, a stream on a given day and, and take a beaker and measure the chemicals in, the, in that water, um, but you're only doing that in, in one instant, in one moment. And um, as people often say, you never step in the same stream twice, right? Well, the fish and the macroinvertebrates live in the stream and so they're more or less sampling the water continually they have to live there um, and so we, we can look at this in terms of uh, uh, environmental disturbance as we as we go from sort of an undisturbed or least disturbed background condition so you, you know think about your your forested headwaters as a least disturbed conditions oftentimes we find the most biologically diverse communities. And as we increase the disturbance with agriculture, building houses, industry, uh, uh, stressing the water uh, with like wastewater, that, that sort of stuff, we, we tend to start losing species and we reduce the, the, the overall diversity and some of the goods and services that we expect of, of our waters. And, and so we have this in the Clean Water Act, uh, the fishable and swimmable goal. That's sort of the very minimum. But the overall goal, as Kevin pointed out, was to maintain, right? So that's fishable and swimmable to maintain, but also restore the integrity of, our, of the nation's waters. And so we're, we're sort of constantly striving to move up and to the left. And, and where possible, restore waters um, to their former condition, especially where we know that that condition can be achieved. None of this stuff is pie in the sky. You know, we want to turn, turn an urban stream back into a trout stream. We know that that's not possible in, in, in all, you know, practicality. It, it's making an honest assessment of what's possible 
and, and try and restore to those endpoints. So chloride, this, these are concentrations um, from Ohio streams for two eco regions. And, and I'm gonna, I'll explain these plots. What they are is they're showing um, box and whisker plots. So uh, the main square part of, the, of each of those um, individual graphs show the, the, where the bulk of the main data are. And so this is within stream size categories. Um, one to 10 square miles on up to 1,000 to 10,000 square miles. So those are, those are big rivers um, in analog, probably um, in, in Wisconsin, 10,000. You're, you're probably looking at the Mississippi River um, before it goes uh, into Illinois or Iowa is about probably that, that size of river at, at 10,000 square miles. And, and um, for comparison, one square miles is, it's something you generally could probably jump across, right? So that's the range of sizes that we're looking at. And in, in Ohio, the Western Allegheny Plateau is, tends to be less populated, more forested, and the Erie Ontario Lake Plains is pretty heavily populated. It's a very worked landscape. It has the um, metropolitan areas of Akron, Canton, Cleveland. So, um, now we can we can kind of compare directly across those size categories the chloride concentrations, and we can obviously see that in that more worked eco region, more populated, uh, more land disturbance, et cetera, higher chloride concentrations, more or less across the board until we get to some of the large the largest streams, and that that's an indication of where <laughs> where we. Uh, see treated wastewater. So um, a lot of our bigger cities are on bigger rivers and that's where they discharge their effluents. And, and so um, as you know, when, whenever, you know, we, we sw you sweat, you can, you can <laughs> it, it, on a hot day, you'll notice it's, it's salty, right? Your sweat is salty. So, so is what, you know, other things that you ex excrete from your body and send down to the treatment plants. So, so part of just our way of life and living tends to enrich our waters with, with chloride and, and other salts. One of the things else you'll notice is that, so in the, in the less disturbed Western Allegheny Plateau, you know, we're starting out with some pretty low chloride concentrations in general, but we do see wide variation. We see the widest in both cases, in, in both ecoregions, we see the widest range of chloride concentrations in our smallest streams. And that's um, in a large part reflection of uh, their vulnerability, their proximity to the stuff that we do on the landscape in, 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 uh, in particular road de-icing. So um, yeah, as, a, as a group, then those small headwaters tend to be the most vulnerable to chloride enrichment. This slide um, simply recapitulates one, one of the, uh, or a couple of the slides that Kevin gave. Again, it's like we're, we're saying, how do we determine protective endpoints? And so the, the, the typical way we do that is we put Daphne in a beaker and kill them and or add chemicals until we kill them. And it, when we get to that point where, you know, chemical X is uh, starting to kill Daphne, that's, <laughs> That forms a, a point on this plot, and, and same with fathead minnows and, and for an array of species. And, and so then you're, you're more or less trying to pick a point where you're saying, hey, we want to be protective of 95% of the species that we're testing. And that's kind of how you set that, that protective threshold. And so that's kind of, you know, traditionally the way we've done that is by doing these laboratory-based uh, studies to set these endpoints. Um, but we can also think about it looking at field data, Do more or less kind of saying, hey, the fish and macroinvertebrates live in the stream. They're experiencing it all the time, these, these concentrations all the time. We can sort of ask them what those endpoints might be. And, and so there were some uh, researchers out of US EPA who developed a method 
um, basically taking exactly the same types of methods that were, are used in the laboratory setting and, and applying them to, to field data. And, and they have their methods laid out. I obviously I'm not going to go into those there, but there's a link if anybody's in, really interested in pursuing it. Um, and so um, I, I took the data for Ohio and used the same methods, uh, but applied it to chloride concentrations. And so what you're what you're seeing in this graph is basically that species sensitivity distribution. Uh, relative to chloride for macroinvertebrates collected in the state of Ohio. And um, the 90, the, so the fifth percentile of this distribution is, is what we call that hazard effect concentration or HC5. And that corresponds to chloride concentrations of, of 54 milligrams uh, per liter. Uh, and if you recall, so this would be very much analogous to a chronic uh, endpoint. Uh, as Kevin pointed out, you know, you have the acute that you never want to see any more than that. You're, you're trying to protect against spills and that sort of thing versus sort of what's the average concentration over a, over a long period of time that, that you would want to see and, and maybe not go past. And so the species sensitivity distribution based on field data is pointing to a number of about 54 milligrams per liter. And so, you know, that um, it, it's lower than, than uh, 150, but it's, you know, kind of sort of in that ballpark, uh, we, could, we could say. One of the things though, that, that sort of looking at the field data does is it also gives you a, a chance to sort of say, hey, let's look at groupings. So in, in this, particular instance, I have highlighted the unionids or the freshwater mussels. We know they're an important uh, class of organisms. They, they provide important ecological functions such as filtering the water. And uh, they also tend to be very endangered. <laughs> so uh, we can look at, look at where those are in relation to the rest of the macroinvertebrates. And, and by and large, we can see, yeah, hey, our unionids as a group tend to be slightly more, as a whole, more sensitive to chloride than the, than the larger, um, or the, the macrovertebrate population as a whole. And we can also plot individual taxon responses relative to chloride and, and observe how, how they behave. And, and so this is all this, this plot is doing. And, and I've got the, uh, some, some of the endpoints that, that have been derived. One is the HC5 is, is, the, is this threshold based on species sensitivity distributions. EL50, that's an effect range that was done uh, based on uh, logistic regression. I'm, I'm not gonna go into that, that was, uh, uh, but it, it provides a separate endpoint. And that endpoint actually is about 125 milligrams per liter. And so that's really close to the Michigan endpoint. And it's, but in that uh, effects range 50, as I said, is based on logistic regression. And that was basically asking the question, where, when, when we look at it in terms of that Clean Water Act goal, where is it that we're going to fail that goal versus where is it we're going to attain that goal? And then uh, the red red line at where I have the chronic um, number, that's the US EPA's current value of 230 milligrams per liter, and then, and then the acute value. And they're arranged on a log 10 scale um, in micrograms per liter. But I, I tried to translate those into, in terms of milligrams per liter um, so you could get an idea for it. Um, a couple other things to convey here. One is across the range of chloride concentrations, we, we see a lot of taxa that have decreasing responses. And they more or less, we can, we can see that, that decreasing response across the range of concentrations, but also um, in some cases, 
at very, very low concentrations. So we know by looking at this, we know that as soon as we start to disturb the land and, and alter that landscape, we will start to lose species. And then there are some species that, that are pretty, pretty resilient and, and hardy. And, and, and so one of the things that this also conveys is one, we can lose very sensitive species in a hurry, but, but in, in terms of like an overall uh, maintaining function, we know that we can lose some species but other species will kind of come in and, and, and take up their function up to a point before the wheels fall off, right? And, and so that's always where this balance is between being protective, having workable numbers for working landscapes and finding a number that, you know, is like your hard and fast, hey, we know if we go beyond this, the wheels fall off, we can never exceed this, this number. One of the other benefits of looking at, at uh, the, the field data and in, in tying chloride concentrations to the macroinvertebrates is we, we can express uh, these heat maps in, both in terms of the chemical concentration and in terms of the tolerance that we observe in the macroinvertebrates uh, um, as a heat map, right? And so, so the, the map on the left is very similar to what Kevin showed. It's just a heat map of chloride concentrations. And you can, you can see the, the Cleveland metro area in the sort of in the upper right part of the state in, in Columbus down to Cincinnati, if you're familiar with, with uh, the Ohio's geography. And, and um, so those are the, the hot spots. And the Western Allegheny Plateau is basically that, that eco region that, that I referred to earlier that's lightly developed tends to have those low concentrations. And that pretty much shows up as the blue in the lower right-hand part of the state. And when we express that in terms of uh, the tolerance that, that we see in macroinvertebrates to chloride, the maps pretty much mimic each other um, by and large. So it, it just provides a you know, unique way of kind of looking at the data, looking at, okay, where, where, <laughs> where are we seeing problems? Where, where do we need to maybe focus effort? Uh, which areas are, are, you know, like the way down in, in Southeast Ohio, where we see we have these pockets of um, very light, lightly disturbed um, landscapes, you know, and we, we see these very, very sensitive macroinvertebrate communities. We know that's a place that you would want to focus preservation efforts. And, um, you know, in some of the transition areas between the urban and the less developed landscapes, those, those might be places where we really want to focus on uh, a potential restoration if, if we're seeing places that are impact, presently impacted, but we think we can move the needle and, and get those restored. So turning back to the to this um, biocondition gradient and thinking about our endpoints that we derive by whatever means, we can begin to, to think about how we um, apply those endpoints, where those endpoints might be appropriate to apply in a given situation, and um, use those in a, in a management overall management structure, and. So the way I, I've, I've divided up this, the biocondition gradient, again, in, in, in terms of increasing levels of environmental disturbance, and I've, I've tried to frame where some of these toxicity-based endpoints may, may act, right? And, and so we're really, those tend to be where we're saying, hey, our minimum expectation for the Clean Water Act, preserving Keep, keeping the wheels from falling off. And these field-based methods tend to be more at saying, where do we want to set the line between this least disturbed and, and working landscape? So if it's a working landscape, again, like I say, we, you know, we know that we're starting to uh, enrich some of, the, some of our streams because of, of road salting. And we're seeing uh, Im impacts to the macroinvertebrate population where, where, where 
can we focus efforts on restoration in those circumstances where we think we can move the needle and bring those back in, into a less disturbed condition that we think that they can attain. And so those field endpoints will, will help in that regard. And, and some of the either, either uh, the tox based endpoints or maybe the endpoints derived from logistic regression based around the, the Clean Water Act endpoint of um, attainment, non-attainment can work in terms of uh, NPDES permits. We want to we want to be able to protect from uh, overexposure in in a in a chronic setting uh, to waters where you know we know we we're in in discharging wastewater. We know it's very hard to reduce chloride in those in those situations. It's almost impossible to get. <laughs> Functionally, it's very, very difficult to remove chloride once it's already in the water. And, and so we can, we can identify caps for those uh, effluents that are at least uh, protective of that minimum goal. And then managing chloride, I'm, I'm sure most folks that are, that are tuning in are probably have already uh, heard a lot of these things, but there are things that, that we can do to address salt enrichment, um, reduce road salt through, through better BMPs. Public outreach is huge. People need to uh, be acquainted with the problem, understand it, uh, take ownership. Uh, that, those are all very important um, in, in getting them to be on board. And, um, one of the things that, that uh, Allison and Kevin and I were, were all involved in a work group in Region 5 to, to try to help with this problem, um, help the various states in the region adopt standards and, and refine those standards and, and develop solutions to, to address the problem. So in, in my parting thoughts, I think a lot of uh, the administrative and programmatic infrastructure around administering the Clean Water Act is, especially in, in terms of water quality standards, it's been very much based on permits. And, and those thing, that administrative framework has served us really, really well and, and um, made enormous benefits in terms of restoring our, uh, the quality of our waters. However, we're starting to come up against a, a separate set of circumstances as we move away from uh, pollutants that come out of a pipe and we're dealing with these pollutants that come from diffuse sources, such as road salt or uh, more generally like nutrients or sediment. And um, that's where I think we, you know, taking, taking more of a all of the above approach Talk, lab studies, field studies will all help inform how we make those management decisions. We need those tox uh, laboratory studies to help us understand the modes of action for like chloride. We can, we can look at the field data, but it doesn't tell us, all it does is make associations. It doesn't tell us how it is that chloride um, directly impacts macroinvertebrates. Does it, you know, mess with their osmoregulation? Is it directly, you know, uh, impair liver function, what, what have you. Those, those laboratory studies are very important for understanding that component. And the field studies are, are I think, are important for just, you know, hey, what do what our eyes tell us kind of, kind of thing, very matter of fact. Um, and, and so we also, in terms of the whole chloride thing, we do need an immediate focus, I think, in terms of where we focus attention on recently suburbanized areas. We really want to pre prevent presently unenriched waters from becoming enriched. Um, and probably one of, the, one of the best ways to go about that is, is through uh, minimizing over application of de-icers. So with that, I think it's time for questions. unmute here and get my video back on. Thank you so much, Bob and Kevin both.
um, as Kevin said, a lot of math here, right? <laughs> and so we appreciate your, um, both of your willingness to try to translate that um, for the rest of us. Um, we did have though a couple questions, um, at least one I saw come in here into the chat. So um, let me pull that up again. So it looks like Alex um, had a question. Bob, this is um, for you. If you don't mind maybe pulling up the slide um, about taxon responses. So to me, someone who's not really trained with this, it looked like a, a lot of scribbles. It looks like Alex is maybe asking for a, a little bit more um, clarification on where we're seeing um, the impact to most taxa. Um, maybe that's the HC5. But if you don't mind just kind of pulling that slide up, maybe I can. And are you, are you seeing it? Let me flip back here. Yeah, we're seeing your presentation, yep. but we still got to get through it. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, yep. there we go. Yeah. So yeah, and to me, I see a, a lot of lines. So each one of those lines is is an individual macroinvertebrate. Okay. It's and the so, response to chloride for an individual macroinvertebrate taxa. Okay. And in terms of of it, it's in terms of uh, probability of observing it. Probability of observing it in a stream that relative that, to the chloride concentration. That chloride concentration. And yeah. do you mind kind of translating? So I know Kevin had chloride concentrations in what micrograms per liter. Um, we've also seen milligrams per liter. So could you explain what kind of values we're seeing at the bottom there with that log scale? Right. So um, so five on this scale would be one hundred milligrams per liter, four would be 10 milligrams per liter. Okay. So some species, it looks like then even around like 10 milligrams per liter of chloride, the likelihood of seeing them is already exactly. decreasing. Right, so what, what you're seeing here is it, it, if, if this is 10 milligrams per liter, you know, it, as soon as you're starting to basically disturb the landscape, you're, you're gonna start losing species. And, and it, you know, as soon as you as soon as you till the soil, basically, you're gonna you're gonna mobilize salts. You can think think of it that way. Or you know, you're building houses, you, you're putting septic systems in, or sewer lines, and discharge whatever what, what have you. Mm -hmm. You you're mobilizing pollutants in general, um, and and so that is you know go, going back to the. Um, the difference between you know having the, the value of the lab studies you're able to isolate on chloride in these you know even though I'm I'm just saying what's the response against chloride there could be other pollutants that are <laughs> along for the ride so to speak so you're never you know a hundred percent sure that it's just chloride that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so there are multiple stressors, right? So chloride is yeah like one stressor, but generally if chloride is going up. You're saying, yeah, maybe more sediment yeah, in the water, I mean, it's changing, yeah, heat or who, who knows. Um, but but when, you, when you look at this really many good. species, one of the values of, of, of looking at sort of the, in the field data, you've got a lot of species. You know, we've got, um, I mean, in a typical sample, in a, in a small headwater, we might have 50 taxa, and then you move up to larger, you, you broaden that. That's just one, one stream in one area. But you broaden that out to uh, to all the headwaters within a given watershed, you might bump that up to three or four hundred taxa, right? Mm -hmm. So, so looking at a at, at, at a bunch of them like that, and even though you, you know you've got um, what we call collinearity, you know there there are uh, pollutants sort of run with each other, but not all, not all uh, tax are sensitive to all pollutants. Some of, some are sensitive to some pollutants and not others, and and, and vice versa, right? So, we, so you look at it as a whole, and you can you can kind of see, yeah, hey, you know, across the board, we see this decreasing response 
-hmm. for, for what we're calling these, these chloride sensitive tacks. So, okay. so um, I guess yeah. in summary, we can say, I'm looking at these two graphs side by side, remembering that four is 10 milligrams per liter chloride in each, five, a hundred, six, a thousand, that a number of species very sensitive, their populations will start going down or maybe they are gone completely from the streams as we get into the tens and then the hundreds of milligrams per liter. And then some other species that are less sensitive, more tolerant are going to take their, their place in the ecosystem. Exactly. To the right, because those lines are going up. Okay, so I think Alex, if that answers your question, maybe you wanna just put something in the chat there. Um, okay, actually, we've already got a couple comments here from Alex, let me catch up. So, so the four listed points are benchmarks that are used. Alex did say he thinks he understands a little better now, didn't get the probability aspect before. Um, has said that's a really neat way to represent the relationship between the chloride concentrations and the species presence. Thank you. Yeah, just needs a little translation. <laughs> um, thank you, Bob. All right, so if anybody else, oh, let's see, has any questions, if you wanna type those into the chat, we can try to get those answered while we um, have Bob and Kevin here on the live stream for a couple more minutes. I guess in the meantime, while I go to look at that, I guess, Kevin, do you have any questions for Bob or Bob for Kevin? Yeah, I, Bob, stuff's super interesting. I always like the way you, you kind of look at data and the volume of data that you guys have to analyze. I think it's really, really cool. And actually, you started touching on some of the things. I really liked your, I mean, a, a few things, the ability to, to like tease out the chloride as the driver especially given like, you know, the, the statewide heat map of chloride concentrations and it overlaps so strongly as ours does with urbanized areas, which means it brings with it all of the other pollutants, um, thermal impacts, water flow impacts, all those other things. And it's just a, it's, it's, I was just, I was just kind of wrestling with like, it makes sense, but can I assign it to chloride? Can I assign it? Do we need to even, you know, at some point, or do we need to just, is it just another kind of feather in the cap for understanding how impactful sort of how we develop the landscape is, whether we're talking chloride or whatever. It's just trying to trying to parse out like assigning blame to chloride. Like you were just saying that collinearity to me is so hard to um think about in my head because I look at your graphs and go, oh, yeah, chloride. But I'm like, I know this is like a component of many things that are impacting these same streams um, and trying to, you know, I don't know, tease it apart. How you, how you, how you take it from that to like management of uh, what, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I mean, I'm most, this is, this is the simplified <laughs> version of <laughs> You know, mostly you were, were looking at, you know, you've got two or three, at least a minimum of like three different things that you might have in a model and you're, you're trying to get an idea um, from that. But uh, yeah, it, I, I think, I think, you know, if we, I always look at it as sort of like, um, what's the simplest thing, right? We know, and I, not to just keep beating the, 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 the same horse, but you know, if, if we have a place that's not disturbed, don't disturb it if we can help it, right? You know what I mean? Because once it's disturbed, it's really hard to get it back. And, and you know, if we frame things on sort of this disturbance gradient, I think it also helps us to, to say, where, what, where, where can we best spend our money and, and on what, right? So, um, you know, where things are, 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 are not too disturbed, but, but um, not too far gone, you know, we, we think we can move some management levers, let's do it. I mean, that doesn't mean that you can't be looking at, you know, the whole scope of your resource. It's right. more about where do you focus. I like your your graph of kind of like at the end there, those circles, you know, bio gradient with like the, the lab-based numbers, the, you know, field-based. The, but again, there, like, you know, so I'm thinking, all right, so our lab-based chronic number of, you know, 150 your field base of 54 or whatever. And they're, they're 
you're right. They are close, but they're also, you know, they're a little far apart. And if you're trying to pick a target, but I think that the field base makes sense, except that I have trouble saying then 54 is the magic number because 54 includes metals and flows and all those other things. And so it's like trying to, yeah, it's, a, it's, I, I guess your point was you, you need it all. I mean, it's always, I always think of this as like a, none of them are, are primary, you know, because we do the same thing. We do biological monitoring. You have goals for that, but we also have these like values, these numerics, and you don't want to, you don't want to miss any of them. You want to hit them all. Exactly. Try to cover I, as many bases as you can. I mean, that's my, 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 one of my things I hope to, 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 to get, a, get across to folks. Um, and I, I know most, most, I, I know you get this, you just said it, um, but, but begin to, rethink, you know, I have a little bit of a paradigm shift in how we apply water quality standards um, to not just be so permit focused. We've got to begin to think about the non-point side of it. And, and I think that more that this all of above strategy is what we need to blend, to fold in that non-point component. Well, that's an excellent segue. Um, we did have another question come in um, via email here. I guess some Buddy, and hopefully not too many people are trying to type into the chat and we're unable to do so. But um, Katie is asking if um, the EPA is planning to update its chloride values um, with new data coming in. So Kevin, it seems like you're saying Michigan um, just really recently set criteria based on this newest data um, as of 2019. I don't know, um, I don't think your table showed what years like the EPA no, set yeah, their levels or if you know that um, and if you have any sense of whether um, there might be something kind of coming down the pipe here um, that incorporates some of this newer data. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I do know like EPA and other US EPA we're talking here, um, I'm mm -hmm. assuming other numbers are, are fairly old. I don't know if Bob, you know, I mean, I feel like 20 years at least, um, but they're, they've been around a while. Um, I, you know, I don't want to pretend that I know, I mean, EPA is working on a lot of things. And so I, you know, who knows what their specific timelines are. I do know for in the, when we're talking about things like chloride and sulfate and some other things, some of these ions, EPA is spending a lot of time looking right now at the sort of interaction. So not quite as, I'm going to go with simplistic, even though I said there's like tons of math and all involved in what we do, but even taking that another step further, which is not just looking at toxicological data of chloride to, you know, different critters, but looking at that in combination with, uh, other ion concentrations, sulfate and some other things, and looking at the, how the interaction of all those, kind of like what we're talking about, even in the broad interaction of like, you know, urbanization and development, but how those things may interact so that, you know, our, our 150 may not be, I, I'll say none of it's perfect. Uh, you promised that, um, mm -hmm. you know, we all do what we can with what we've got. Um, but, but they're trying to look at whether or not the interaction kind of models may be a better way to go forward. So I expect that that's probably, is that fair, Bob? Do you think that, that that's probably, I feel like that's what we've been here from EPA is that they're, you know, kind of, but I don't know any kind of time frame on that at all. I mean, well, I, 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 I would think one of the other, the first question to ask is what, what might be the impact of the Supreme court case on them doing um, promulgating anything at this point. I think there's probably a lot of open questions regarding that talking about the recent like the recent one where they yeah they re ruling again uh, about the regulatory um aspects um EPA I, I don't versus know the, west virginia right was it yeah yeah so they basically pushed a lot of that back into um the legislative branch's hands so i mean can I don't, I mean, and it's not, again, I don't, I'm just asking the question. I don't know where this is going right. to um, fall out, but I mean, I, I can't look at what Kevin went through and what he laid out. Can you imagine somebody trying to do that on the legislative side? How, how does that work? I don't understand. Yeah, definitely bigger questions here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I would be interesting to see what that is, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if business is proceeding um, as usual as much as possible, then I, I think, um, I, I know USCPA is very interested in trying to uh, re uh, update the chloride mm -hmm. standard. And I don't know when that's going to happen, but, but I, I'm pretty sure that's in the works. 
And I guess I, um, we, we can say that um, the EPA is working to yeah, get more information out um, to the public. We'll hopefully have a new website or a web page up on chlorides as soon as um, this fall, hopefully. And um, at, with Wisconsin Saltwise, we're excited that um, we might be able to help contribute some content to that as well. So um, we are kind of at or past our one hour time limit. So if anybody does have additional questions, um, you can feel free to email them to me and I can pass them along, get you in touch with Bob or Kevin and or Kevin. Um, but I, yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody now who was able to join. And again, feel free to share this link out with others. And um, next month, we're going to have very um, major swing in terms of the topic and hear um, Bill Kern, who is the highway superintendent with Jefferson County in Southern Wisconsin, talk about direct liquid application. So using liquid brine both before, um, during, and, and after the storm. So diving right into management um, conversations there. But um, thanks again, Bob and Kevin, for joining us this month and getting some um, good fodder out there for us to kind of chew on. I know we had a number of people um, more on, on the conservation side joining us today, and I'll probably be following up um, with, with each of you to um, kind of help take some of this um, work out as I um, am very fortunate to be able to do a lot of outreach across Wisconsin and um, recently was invited to go out to Colorado for the Western States APWA conference this fall. So they want to um, hear about um, the environmental impacts of salt, which I take as very promising that we're seeing a lot of appetite to understand impacts and um, best practices. And anything I can do to help, just let me know. Glad to. And, and if you need very, somebody to carry bags, on here. You go, I'll go to Colorado and carry your bags. Yeah, yeah, you, you'll, you'll help out. <laughs> <laughs> All expenses paid trip. You know, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you um, both again so much and enjoy the rest of your summer week. Thank right. you. Thank you.